This week on Christian World News. Their mission is to connect people to heaven. Um, and as a storyteller, I was like, that's unique. Hillsong is much more than a worship band. Now it's the subject of a major motion picture. We go behind the scenes of the new movie, Hillsong, Let Hope Arise. Plus, they've been called modern day lepers. Syrian refugees are unwanted in the Middle East and the West. Many say evangelical Christians are their greatest friends. And seeing Jerusalem the way Jesus saw it will take you along for this special trip back in time to the cradle of Christianity. And hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas and a very happy birthday well, to my so co-anchor Wendy. It has been a very happy day so far. Well, a happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Hillsong began as a tiny church in Australia. Now they worship in more than a dozen locations around the globe. And get this, on any given Sunday, 50 million churchgoers sing a song from Hillsong Music. One Hollywood producer attended a service and felt that their story needed to be told on the big screen. Ephraim Graham has more. What treasure waits within your skies? This gift of freedom, go camp by. They call themselves a ragtag collection of musicians, but the results tell a different story. Hillsong United songs are sung in 60 different languages, and the band has sold more than 17 million albums. Not that it was our, like, we just set out to write songs that our friends would listen to and like, you know, so we would listen to bands that we liked and then, you know, want to make music that kind of was culturally relevant, I guess, and then, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't have scripted how this has happened, and like, we never set out to tour the world and like, to make music full time, but yeah. it's just been, one step after the other of trusting God. He used to do stuff like that, but he doesn't anymore. While someone might not have scripted the story, the band's rise to chart-topping musicians is told on screen in the feature film, Hillsong, Let Hope Rise. It's not a about a church or about what we do with writing songs or making music or serving God. It's the story of who God is, that he uh, uses, he loves, ordinary people, he loves everybody, and that he has a plan for everybody, and everybody on earth is invited into his story. What's that? I was just writing a line. The Hillsong story got the attention of director Michael John Warren, the mind behind rap giants Jay-Z's Fade to Black, and Nicki Minaj's My Time Now, and he is not a Christian. I'm a music nerd. I love music more than I love film. So you go from doing films on Jay-Z and mm -hmm. Nicki Minaj mm -hmm. to Hillsong? Yeah. <laughs> Natural progression? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, you know, with music films, uh, the story is a little bit challenging, um, you know, because what's really at stake for a pop artist? And the answer is, you know, they're trying to stay hot. They're trying to prove they're the best rapper. I mean, there's a lot of drama there. And if certainly with an artist like Nicki, there's just drama. Um, thank God. Uh, and for them, with Hillsong, for me, I saw a, a unique story. Their mission is to connect people to heaven. Um, and as a storyteller, I was like, that's unique. Even though an estimated 50 million churchgoers sing Hillsong's music each week, Hollywood's interest still surprises band members. I know that when they first said a movie about Hillsong United, you guys said, why make a movie about us? So now that we've got it, what do you think? <laughs> kind of the same. Is anyone going to want to watch it? <laughs> yeah. we, I mean, we, I, love, I love that the message of you know, the things that we actually care about, the thing that, that we want to encourage people the most is actually threaded throughout the film. And, and um, I think Hillsong Let Hope Rise is, it, it, it's a film that, that has a, a message of hope.
That uplifting message rings out in the story of how singer Taya Smith became part of the band. Taya, I guess one of the things that surprised me in the film is you arrive in Sydney with $200 and just, Lord, use me? Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a faith step. It was a faith step. Moved out of home, felt like it was the right time, even though, like I said, like you said, I only had $200 in the bank, but I was just trusting God with it, and um, turns out it was the the best move I could have ever made, and it was like God's timing. In many ways, the band's success story echoes that of Hillsong Church. When we started a church on the outskirts of Sydney, Australia, we were just <laughs> thinking about people coming back next week. Really. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, I've always been a visionary, but it, the whole, our whole story's been a great story. One that points upward to heaven. Uh -huh. And that's the entire point of the film. I just think when people can walk into an atmosphere like that and sense God's presence, they, their eyes are lifted that there's probably more to this world than they realize. Doing this film change you in any way? Absolutely. Being around people like that um, is meaningful, and it helps. It helped me become a better person. Um, everyone asks me, all my non-Christian friends are like, "Are you saved?" I'm like, "No, I'm not. <laughs> I haven't been saved, but um, I'm a better person now, and and I feel like I have. Um, I feel like I, you know, you take what you, you, you know. I feel like I have like a role model, sort of how to treat people and, and how to be more loving. Uh for an unbeliever, that's a seed planted. I love them, and I love Darlene Check, who is a, one of the original singers. Well, if you want more details on the Hillsong story, Pastor Brian Houston has written a book. It's called Live, Love, Lead. And uh, Live, Love, Lead, George. I like that, right? It is nice. <laughs> and you can find it wherever books are sold. Coming up. They've lost their homes, and they're not welcome in most places. How will the world resolve the Syrian refugee crisis? Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. 
Despite a ceasefire, Syrians continue to flee their war-torn country, adding to the already massive refugee problem. This week, a coalition of faith, community and national security groups delivered a message to America's leaders. They say it's time to take action. Jennifer Wishon explains. As more and more Syrians flee civil war, concerns over how and where to care for them grows. It's a moral, political and security issue with no easy solutions. And I can't forget, and I'll never forget, that Jesus too was a refugee. He was a refugee. He had to go to Egypt, you may recall. And what would have happened if they wouldn't have accepted him? Congressman Vargas joined a coalition of groups calling on President Obama and Congress to do more. They delivered 10,000 signed postcards to Republican leaders, asking them to increase humanitarian aid by 30 percent, double the number of refugees the U.S. accepts, and guarantee the right to work and opportunity for education for at least one million more refugees. This is not just a moral crisis that we face as a country and as a people. It's a political crisis worldwide. Refugees are not a temporary problem. It is a permanent problem. Those of us who think, well, in a couple of years it'll be over, wrong. Just weeks ago, America welcomed her 10,000th refugee from Syria, meeting a goal set by President Obama. Going forward, the president wants the U.S. to accept 110,000 refugees, including 40,000 from the Middle East and South Asia. Many Americans are concerned terrorist or radicalized refugees will slip into the country. But New Jersey Congressman Bill Pascrell suggests something else is at play. This is home-baked prejudice. There's no other way to call it. Let's call it the way it is. And Europe has to do the same. And it's not facing that responsibility. The bigotry, the right-wing nativism and xenophobia that is sweeping Europe and I add our own country is a problem not of temporary duration. It's one we got to confront head on. As Jews, we know what it is to be victims of prejudice and to be excluded disrespected and targeted because of our religious identity. As the U.S. prepares to open its doors to more than 100,000 refugees from around the world, many countries accept none or very few refugees from Syria, including many Muslim countries in the Persian Gulf like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. Next week, President Obama joins world leaders at the United Nations, where he'll encourage them to step up and help the Syrian people. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. The evangelical Christian agency World Relief has helped settle thousands of refugees here in the U.S. Recently, CBN's Abigail Robinson sat down with World Relief President Scott Abriter in our Washington, D.C. bureau. She asked him about the challenges and rewards of accepting more Syrian refugees into the U.S. Hi. Since 9-11, 800,000 refugees have been resettled in the U.S., and we don't have a known single case of domestic terrorism from a refugee. Mm -hmm. And with the really lengthy due diligence process that exists, we have a good record of due diligence and protecting our homeland even as we've been compassionate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have criticized President Obama as saying that he's only accepting Muslim refugees despite the fact that 10 percent of the population of Syria is Christian and this year alone we've accepted 11,000 Syrian refugees and only 56 of them have been Christian. What do you think about, I mean are those complaints warranted or? Well if you look at those numbers all by themselves you would say boy there's a question to be asked there and it's a reasonable question but if you pull out the lens a little bit and look at the context 39 percent of the refugees that have been resettled um, from the Middle East since 2001 have been Christians and uh, part of the issue with the Syrians is that the very thing that we want which is really careful due diligence which takes a year to a year and a half to do means that many of those Syrian Christians who were not part of that crisis at that point in time haven't entered through that whole process yet. Also, fortunately, many of the Syrian Christians have been able to find refuge with other Christian communities in Europe and other places in the Middle East, so they have been a less vulnerable population in many cases. Who are the refugees coming over and what do you think are some of the biggest conceptions Americans have about them? 
The refugees that are coming over are moms and kids, in some cases dads, um, that are coming out of families just like yours and mine, where they long to have a place called home and that home has been taken from them. Interesting thing that we find among refugees is many of them will carry their house keys with them yet. They're not going back home. They probably know that, but there's something in them, just like in us, that says, but I want to go home. They're not looking to be resettled. They don't want to be in a different land. They want to go home to the land and the community and the culture that they're a part of, but it's not available to them. So I think one of the big misconceptions is, is that they're looking for just simply to, uh, a chance to better themselves economically. That may happen, it may not. What they're really looking for is a chance to survive because if they stay where they are, they face death from the very people that we are trying to stop as well. As a friend of mine said, um, we have to be careful not to punish the victims of ISIS for the sins of ISIS. What are some of the biggest needs that you all have as an organization? I want you to imagine the picture of a refugee coming in on an airplane, not speaking the language, being frightened about what they will find, having no sense of what their visible support is going to be. And they come off the airplane and they are met by a group of people from a local church. We call them good neighbor teams. They take them out to the van where they have gathered other people, including people from their homeland who speak their language. They take them to the apartment that's been furnished by the local church with the help of World Relief. They show them the groceries that they have put in their refrigerators. They tell them that they'll be back to help them get signed up for English as a second language courses. They'll talk to them about uh, the ability to get into job training and they'll say, and by the way, we have a community called our church and our arms are wide open to you. Can you imagine what that means to someone? Jesus was very clear. He said, do to others what you would have done to you. What would I want done if the bottom had fallen out of my life? If I had to escape my homeland, my house was in rubbles, I might, even not, I might not even have all my children or my husband or my wife, but I've escaped with what I have. What would I want done to me? We're looking for people who will say, I know what I would want done and I'm prepared to do it for others. Many of us care deeply about unreached people groups. And what God has done in this season is he has said, I'm bringing them to you. And the fear is, is that we'll pull up the welcome mat and we'll say, well, thank you, Lord, but no. We'll maybe send a few people over to them, but we're going to resist the ones that you're sending to us. Thanks, Abigail. We have lots more on this topic on our website, and you can hear interviews about the number of Muslims coming to Jesus in the Middle East, or you can find out what you can do to show the love of Christ to refugees. Find it all at cbnnews.com. Coming up, see how ancient artifacts in the Holy Land are bringing the Bible to life. In the beginning was the Word. From CBN, the Gospel of John, read by Pat Robertson. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Let the spoken Word of God transform your mind and increase your faith. Receive the power of God's life-giving Word, the Gospel of John, read by Pat Robertson. Available now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. 
when you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. And welcome back to Christian World News. The Holy Land is a popular destination for Christians, of course. Thousands visit biblical sites in Israel each year. And you have been there. Three right? times. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> fantastic place. Now they can enjoy a guided journey that uses artifacts to bring life to details from the time of Jesus. Julie Stoll takes us on the Cradle of Christianity tour. Have you ever wondered what Jerusalem looked like 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth? This giant model of Jerusalem from the second Jewish temple period begins the Cradle of Christianity tour. Visitors to the Israel Museum see artifacts that will enhance stories from the Bible. This is Jerusalem that Jesus knew. This is Jerusalem that Herod the Great built. Senior curator David Meverock said the model will give Christians a better perspective of specific areas mentioned in Scripture. Right behind me is the Temple and the Temple Mount, the largest monument in the city. The model, built in a scale of 1 to 50, shows these important sites that Jesus goes through. For instance, on my left are the pools of Bethesda, uh, where Jesus is, uh, performs one of his miracles of healing. It's all in the surrounding of this city, which has only one temple for one God. The famous shrine of the book housing the Dead Sea Scrolls is the next stop. The scrolls include the oldest copies of books of the Hebrew Bible. And then there's the Temple Mount. We still have the supporting walls of the Temple Mount. The Wailing Wall is the western wall of the support of this huge project. But only very few finds were left from the buildings in itself. Two important artifacts from there are part of the tour. One of them is an inscription in Hebrew, a sign for the priest to stand and blow the horn for the entrance of Saturday, meaning the time to cease work, and again at the exit of Saturday when you can resume work. The other sign is in Greek. It is the perimeter that surrounded the temple itself in the Temple Mount with signs in Greek and in Latin forbidding Gentiles to enter the temple itself. According to Meverach, it's rare to find artifacts that directly relate to historical figures. In the case of the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, we've been extremely lucky. Three finds relate directly to the story and to the details, and two of them relate directly to the most important people in these final days of Jesus. One is an ossuary, a burial bone box inscribed with Joseph, son of Caiaphas, the high priest. We are almost 100% sure that this is the Caiaphas that we know from the stories in the New Testament, the high priest that arrests Jesus and turns him into the Romans for his trial. The second is a stone bearing the name of Pontius Pilate. And perhaps the most interesting artifact for Christians is evidence of the Roman practice of crucifixion found in a bone box. This is the only find in the whole world of actual crucifixion. And what do visitors have to say? Just seeing the artifacts made it come alive. And to, to see what I've read about made it come alive in my life. To see so many um, uh, artifacts of world history and of our Christian faith in one place so quickly and to be able to comprehend it so quickly uh, is just really amazing. And it really confirms uh, our faith. It confirms what the Bible teaches us. Um, and, uh, and teaches us the, the place of our Christian faith within world history context. It's outstanding. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Israel Museum, Jerusalem. And thank you, Chris Mitchell. See more great stories from the Holy Land on our Jerusalem Dateline program. You can find it at cbnnews.com. We will be back right after this. Hello, this is Pat Robertson. I've just finished recording one of the most beloved books in all the Bible, The Gospel According to John. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. My hope is that you will use this recording to allow the Word of God to abide in you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish 
and it will be done for you. Listen to it again and again and speak the words along with me. Let these great passages fill your heart as the Word of God transforms your mind and builds your faith. Receive the power of God's life-giving Word, the Gospel of John, read by Pat Robertson, available now. May God richly bless you as you meditate on Jesus. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. And welcome back to Christian World News. Heavy flooding in China this month swept away people's homes and even their livelihoods. Yeah, CBN disaster relief teams were on hand to help them start putting their lives back together. Mengfi Li has the story. Heavy rains caused disastrous flooding only two hours away from China's capital city. Twelve villages near Xintai were destroyed. Local farmers felt hopeless and heartbroken. We just built the new farmhouse before the flooding. I can't believe it's all gone. Right now we have to sleep at different places. All of my farmland has been washed away. Water and electricity have been cut off at schools, and children are forced to study outside their classrooms. Parents are desperate for help and comfort. In the midst of these challenges, CBN China, in partnership with Xintai Church, brought hope and love to the city. Eleven people traveled to four villages, delivering food and tools to over a hundred affected families. The families expressed happiness and relief as they lined up to receive the food and the tools they will use to rebuild their houses. They praised CBN's effort and dedication. I can't believe what CBN brought to us. I'm very surprised to see all the trucks are full of food and stuff to help us. Thank you, CBN. Thank you. In addition, the CBN China team will partner with other local churches to develop a long-term plan. They're introducing the Chinese flood victims to Jesus Christ and helping them to restart their lives. Meng Fei Li for CBN News. Thank you so much. Well, folks, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. Yeah, please follow us on Twitter. Twitter, I'm Wendy GCBN, and you are? Uh, GR Thomas. Well, until next week, goodbye. And from all of us here, God bless you. <laughs>